Demetra says, question for the Monday Q&A. I'm starting to go on podcasts and do trainings for shoe stores. At the end, when they ask how people get, can get in touch with me, if they want to learn more, I have two options I could mention. Firstly, I could mention our quiz, which serves as a lead magnet, where I grab their email. The lead magnet leads into a conversation with me and them into the main offer. Alternat alternatively, I could direct them to my website, which features a Loom video. Should I mention just one of these options or should I mention both? Frankie, what's your advice? Johnny says, does anyone else here insist the client allow you to first build them a website designed to optimize all marketing efforts? TJ's up says, do you guys give any perks to clients for receiving a video testimonial? What's up, everybody? It's Tom! It's Tom! It's Q&A! Tom! <laughs> Uh, we're back to our usual shenanigans. You guys are asking some really smart questions, building some cool stuff. Excited to share that with you guys. Uh, one thing that's been really, really cool for us, um, I've figured out how to uh, to almost take every part of an, a uh, an agency and have AI assist with it. Doesn't mean it'll finish everything for you, but creating content, we can take you 90% of the way. And creating Loom videos can create you 90% of the way. Uh, not quite there yet, but we will be with onboarding. We will be with hiring. We will be with training. We will be with SOPs. We're building a massive library of all the stuff that works. And then training AI to help you create it with a couple of buttons and just answer a couple questions. So that's going to be pretty exciting times. I feel that, uh, that we're getting to the point where... Uh, implementation is getting easier which i think is the real magic thing plus we got an awesome community so <clears throat> right now <clears throat> the wolf pack is actually closed uh, as i feel like we're we're at a good limit for right now for what i'm personally capable of managing but for those of you guys who are interested reach out and when we do open up spots i will let you know um for anyways uh let's get into the good stuff enough of rambling about the unimportant stuff let's talk to you guys and what you're building and your questions well, ladies and gentlemen boys and girls children of all ages Frankie Finn proudly brings to you our weekly Q&A. Ba-dum, ba -dum, ba, -dum, ba -dum. Don't, don't act like you're not impressed by the dad guns. I actually feel like this is the one bicep exercise I do, is lifting kids, the toddler lift. It's not, it's not like heavy lifting, but it definitely builds endurance in the bicep. So, yeah, not, sculpting. <laughs> Anyways, enough of the shenanigans. Demetrius is up first. Demetra says, question for the Monday Q&A. I'm starting to go on podcasts and do trainings for shoe stores. At the end, when they ask how people get, can get in touch with me, if they want to learn more, I have two options I could mention. Firstly, I could mention our quiz, which serves as a lead magnet, where I grab their email. The lead magnet leads into a conversation with me and them into the main offer. Alternat alternatively, I could direct them to my website, which features a Loom video. Should I mention just one of these options or should I mention both? Frankie, what's your advice? Okay, so um, this is a really, really, really intelligent question. And uh, for those of you guys, by the way, not familiar with the, the shoe store, the shoe store is an analogy I use, which essentially means other people's audiences, especially when those people have other people's buying audiences. For me, I first started to experience this when uh, I would speak, I, I wanna say like 2017, at a lot of the legal conferences. And when you get off stage at a conference, it's not unusual that you sign five, 10, 15 clients, not always right away at the back of the room. Sometimes they come to you a day later. Sometimes they schedule a call with you, they Google you after, and they might show up a week or two later in your system. But you know, it's pretty normal to sign five, 10, 15 clients, and you can add 20, 30, 40 grand a month in recurring revenue in one little speech, which is not a bad day at the office. And I wish I could tell you it's because I'm so awesome and dynamic and charming. Clearly it's all those things. But the truth is, that everybody who went to the conference and spoke signed 5, 10, 15 clients at least. That's why they were doing it, right? And so I attribute it more to the fact that it was an audience of buyers. They had, you know, in my case, they had spent a few thousand dollars to be at that legal conference. They had to buy tickets. They had to book flights. They had to book hotels. Like I knew they were serious about growing their law practice because they had invested several thousand dollars to be there. Um, so anyway, uh, point being is the fastest way I believe to grow an agency is to get in front of other people's buying audiences and then give them value in, in the form of ideas and content that ultimately lead into your thing. So rather than kind of like beat up this theoretically, I'll show you how I would structure this as an example because it's not just about what you say at the end of it. You want to think about the whole thing in its entirety and be strategic. So let's say, for example, 
that I had a service that was about onboarding for agencies. I don't, just so you guys know, but go with me on the analysis here. And I just want to show you how like I would structure it. So say for example, uh, you know, like I have um, an onboarding, you know, done for you kind of service, right? So what I would do is if I was going to go on a podcast, I would actually give away my whole process for free, knowing that um, people are going to pay for that on the implementation side. And I say this to you because what you say on the podcast has just as much to do with the conversion as what you say at the end of it, right? Like, so, so we want to think about strategically designing it so the whole thing leads into itself. So, for example, if I was doing that onboarding, I would give away my process. I would talk about onboarding, how it leads to retention, how if you do it right, you're going to keep clients for longer. They're going to trust you. They're going to be easier to deal with. They're going to be easier to communicate with and so forth and all of those things that kind of tie in together. And that's the onboarding piece. Then um, at the at the end of that, I would probably do the two options and I would say, hey, if you're looking for a little sort of swipe file that shows you how to onboard in five easy steps, like we got a downloadable thing, um, you know, click here and get it. And then I would say, or if you just want us to do it for you and you don't even want the thing, just go here. And I would make those, if I was doing that on a podcast, easy to remember URLs, like go to website.com, right? Like not, not go to website.com slash 78q4p.php like that you, you want it to be easy to say easy to remember so if you have to create a special forwarding link or forwarding domain for a podcast that's probably worth it now having said that i'm a believer in that long term the best thing you can do is get people onto a list because then it gives you 27 chances to convert them but also like if they want to buy it right now just let them fucking buy it right so i, I would probably do the both options but it's important that strategically the whole thing is congruent, which is why I gave you that whole example, right? Like, like if I'm giving away an onboarding process and then I have an onboarding cheat sheet and then I have an onboarding done for you, it all makes sense. It all flows into itself. Where it doesn't work is when it's like, it's too much of a curveball, right? Like if I spent an hour talking to you about Facebook ads and then said, download our SEO checklist, you'd be like, huh? I thought, I thought this was the Facebook ads guy, right? And then I said, oh, we also got a quiz. And uh, if you want, we can run Facebook ads for you, whatever. Like it, it would just be incongruent. So you want the whole presentation and the downloads with the presentation to be almost like a logical next step. Hey, you shared all this great onboarding advice. Now give me a tool that helps me implement it or give me the option to just have you implement it for me. But everything is designed to simplify their implementation. So in your case, I'd say, hey, we got a quiz that tells you how to do blah, blah, blah. And if you just want us to do that, you can go here. And I would mention both of those things with easy to remember URLs. But again, the presentation has to flow into that. You want to talk about the process that you uh, give away the process that you're essentially going to charge for the implementation on the back end. Hope that makes sense because if you do that incongruent, they ain't gonna buy the thing at the end of it. But if you do that congruent, it just, it almost makes sense for them to get the next thing, whatever it is that you offer. Um, okay, next, uh, so anyways, I hope that's all. Next question we got, we got anonymous. Anytime you guys are anonymous, I assume you have no pants on. Just calling it like it is, my folks. But it's okay. We we run internet businesses so we can work pantsless. So uh, just so you guys know, I do have some shorts on. Don't get too excited. <laughs> Shenanigans never stop. Anyway, so this is a longer one. Um, I want to give you guys some backstory on this and, and kind of help you guys, for those of you guys who are struggling to, to, to kind of like get your stuff to catch, to how to do that. So he says, hi everyone, I'm blocking out the entire week to jumpstart my prospecting and selling process to landscaping companies. If you were to have five full days to do nothing but rework your client acquisition strategy, what would you focus on? I've already tried the following without much success. Cold email campaign, uh, seven figure agency program, dream 30 list with handwritten notes and gifts, free marketing audits and offers, emailing industry publications to offer to collaborate on content. I've been considering pivoting to some of the following, standardized video of marketing system, results guarantee 30 leads in 30 days or your money back, meta ads, picking up the damn phone and cold calling people myself. I've reached out to 1400 contacts, provided 17 marketing audits to those who are interested and had four calls that went well, but fizzled out. I've always worked off of referrals, but I'm trying to systematize my offerings to scale more efficiently. This selling stuff is pretty new to me. Um, 
Any thoughts are very appreciated. I need a little boost to get back in the game. Right now, it's just the shitty website, SEO, paid ads, social offer that they get every day to their inbox, which I think is a huge part of the problem. I went down a rabbit hole with the 7FA system, which is uh, a great system for some. I just don't know that it's for me. It seems that more are the same. I'm thinking developing an introductory offer um, either a three-part email reactivation campaign, a two-week Facebook ad campaign that I basically use to provide costs to get my foot in the door. All right, listen, Anonymous. Uh, Firstly, I feel you. I feel you. Like sometimes just like getting through the sales hurdle that when you want to sell stuff to people that you actually know how to help, just getting them to say yes to the damn thing. Uh, Just so you guys know, like in my uh, second agency, uh, we went over in six months. Right. So like, you know, like I had a lot of success in that. But just you guys know, I had a six month period where I made exactly zero sales, zero dollars, had zero to show for it. And you better believe like I was running out of money and had, you know, the anti cheerleaders going, why don't you just get a real job and all those kind of things that come with that. Um, so that was like a, a tough little restart. So I feel you. And, and, and same as you, it was not for lack of effort. It wasn't like I wasn't trying stuff or wasn't putting stuff out there, wasn't trying to like, you know, ultimately succeed with it. It just wasn't working. So. This is something that I wish more people really understood in the business because I'm hoping to make this simpler for you. You said if you had five days, I actually think the most important of the five days that you spend is going to be day one of the five days. And day one is is to me, part of the reason why all of this is a struggle is because you just don't really know what a landscaping company wants. And so like you're trying to like figure it out, which is not the same as hearing it directly from the horse's mouth. So I see like, hey, should I guarantee this many leads? Should I, uh, you know, do this? Should I do a reactivation? Should I do my foot in the door? And all of those things are useful to think about, just not as step one in this process. And so I, I say this because businesses have to be market driven. And so the example I use, but it kind of like illustrates the point. My hometown of Windsor, Ontario, Canada has like way too many auto body shops. It's like an industrial kind of factory city. And I don't know, it's just got a lot of fucking auto body shops. And I presume a lot of those auto body shops, uh, they start for entirely selfish reasons. Meaning a person says, I don't want to work for a boss anymore. Fuck this. Like I'm tired of just getting told what to do by the man. I'm going to go start my own shop. And then they start their own shop and they struggle because there's literally just too many auto body shops. Now, um, I tell the story, but it illustrates the point of a market driven business. So I don't know. I was at my brother's house. We ordered some Chinese food. Him and his wife were fighting. The whole calamity ensues. Chinese food guy hands us our food in the middle of them fighting. He leaves. Five minutes later, I feel like I'm having deja vu because the same Chinese food driver knocks at the door with his egg rolls and whatever. And he points and he had, I don't know if he was texting or whatever, but he backed up into my brother's car and my brother's car backed up into my girlfriend's car. Now, earlier than that, a few months earlier, she told me her dream car was a Volkswagen Beetle. So we decided to buy a Volkswagen Beetle. And uh, what ended up happening is, as part of the insurance process, they say you got to bring your car to three auto body shops. So we did, and all of them said the same three things, which is normally you get a quote from each and you go with the cheapest. Well, they said to us, we don't work on Volkswagens because there's too many specialty parts. There's a guy on Drulard Road. Go see him. Now, the guy on Drulard Road, when we got there, he was backed up for a month and said, hey, talk to your, I can definitely fix it. Leave it here. I'll take care of it. I'll fill out all the paperwork. But you're going to have to talk to your insurance company, and they're going to have to give you a loaner car for a month. Now, in the auto body shop where most of the people struggle to sell, this guy has a month's worth of work backed out, booked out, and will get continue to get more work. And the reason is very simple. His business is market-driven. Does he have selfish reasons to exist? Of course. Of course, right? He, like he, he probably doesn't want to work for somebody else either. But he also had market-driven reasons, which is there was an actual real need for Volkswagens. Like it was an underserved part of the market. So to me, step one is not figuring out what your thing is to figure out who, what landscapers are actually trying to move away from and towards. And almost, I can tell you, like, there's, there's probably two big things, seasonality and work for their guys. You know, like the ups and downs, it's slow in summer, it's busy in winter, whatever it is. That sort of seasonality and, and the fact that, like, hey, I got guys, I got to pay and I need work for them. And probably they want specific types of work. So to me, like, step one is learn everything you possibly can about landscapers. That means I join landscapers community. I read books. I read blogs, things about what is being told to landscapers. What is it that landscapers want? And ideally, go places where you can ask them questions. Communities. Send one-on-one messages if you got to. And I usually just ask them these two questions, like, as my starting place. What do you wish you had less of? 
and what kind of like jobs do you wish you had more of? And what will happen is a landscaper will tell you what a landscaper wants and that will make all of your prospecting easier because you'll begin to speak the language. In fact, somebody just sent me a Loom video this morning and it was like, it was really well done in terms of presentation and things like that, but it missed the vital piece of just actually knowing what the people in your market want. And, as soon, and so like if I ask an attorney, they'll say, I want the big cases. I want the bigger cases. I want the trucking cases. I want the motorcycle cases. I want the severe accident cases. I want nursing home cases, right? Like they'll, they'll be specific. And what they don't want is I don't want any more traffic tickets. I don't want any small stuff. Don't bring me any of that. It's just like it, it costs me a lot of money to fulfill on. I got to pay my paralegal. It backs us up. We don't even make money on it. It's like it's a lot of work. There's a ton of other people who do it, people who do it better than us. Bring us the big cases. That's what we want, right? Well, the minute I know they want big cases, like now my, my outreach becomes, I'm going to show you how to get the big cases. Now any content I create is, let me show you how to get the big cases. Any webinar I create is, I'm going to show you how to get the big cases. Any sort of like content like that goes in the magazine, I'm going to show you how to get the big cases. It's all related to that central promise, which is an idea called what they want. So if you don't know what they want, it's almost always 75% what they're moving away from and 25% what they're moving towards. And if you figure out those two pieces, which like, again, cannot come from you, can only come from a landscaper, right? Like if I'm trying to sell to real estate agents, only a real estate agent can tell me what they want. If I'm trying to sell to agency owners, only agency owners can tell me what they want. If I'm trying to sell to attorneys, only attorneys can tell me what they want. So I think you're just missing that fundamental piece. And I, the reason I share that story, because it's not often like a completely different fucking deliverable. It's just a 10% shift in what you're already doing. It's the difference between, hey, let me show you how you can get more people with Facebook ads versus let me show you how we can get a couple of the big cases from Facebook ads, right? It's almost the identical promise, but it doesn't land. The, the, the big cases lands a thousand times harder because that's what they actually want. That's what they actually told us they want. So to me, if I was going to spend five days, I don't know if you ever heard that um, – a Blinken, I think it was. Maybe I don't know, man. Like the internet, like maybe I'm just mixing up my metaphors. But somebody says, like, if I had six hours to cut down a tree, I'd spend the first two hours sharpening my saw. Like the piece that's missing is is the sharp or the sharpening the axe is the piece that's missing is you got to sharpen the axe and actually get it on point with what they want. And again, it'll this will probably shift the nature of your messaging 10%, but you'll find it just works so much better. So before you get into the, like the tactical, should I do outreach? Should I guarantee this? Should I guarantee that? And all of those tactical questions are, are important. Um, but at the end of the day, like the most important piece is get, get what they want right and then everything else will flow out of that. And then your promise is based around that. Now, now, do, do should you do it as a first date? I'm a believer in yes, because it helps you screen for the right types of clients. Uh, but having said that, like there's there's really only three, maybe four ways that like you get in front of clients. You either put content in front of them so that they come to you, you cold message them one-to-one -one so that they know you exist, or um, you run paid ads and like, you know, essentially put up digital billboards that interrupt them to find them. And it's really like, there, there ain't a lot of new stuff in the getting clients, but but the, the fundamentals of get the offer right, like to me, like actually get up, like promise something they want. Again, this is a 10% shift. We do Facebook ads, not desirable. We do Facebook ads to get you motorcycle cases. Very sexy, very desirable. Like from an execution standpoint, it's almost the same fucking thing, right? So I say that to you because if you're not sure, ask as many landscapers as you can and it's really easy to do this in, like in community is my favorite way to do it but also um i did a, a free training on this called the unfair sales advantage you can go to youtube type beyond agency profits unfair sales advantage again beyond agency profits unfair sales advantage and it'll show you landscapers are already having that discussion or whatever you guys listening to whatever your target market is they're already having this discussion you just have to like lean into it and listen to it and i like to use reddit and quora as my two favorite places to listen into and i'll tell you why because they conveniently upvote the answers right so like if like 27 landscapers all agree that this is a problem that they have or this is what sucks about the industry then like <laughs> chances are you can take that to the bank right and and almost always like what, what this creates is in your messaging is you're literally like a parrot you're not writing anything you're not 
saying you're like literally just feeding back to them what they already told you so like i think for example i can remember a lawyer one i found in the early days and it said by far the hardest part about being an attorney are the clients i don't mean the good clients who are who trust you and see you as the learned analysis of a professional i mean the clients who are in this on principle or just want to make somebody else hurt and they don't listen right and they think they know the law better than you well when i'm giving a speech in person this is what my speech sounds like hey how many of you attorneys feel like the hardest part by far of being an attorney are the clients themselves i don't mean the good clients who listen to you and trust you as the learned analysis of a professional i mean the clients who are in this on principle or want to make somebody else hurt or the clients who think they know the law better than you right and all i've done in that is just parrot word for word word for word literally word for word what they said to me Right, and then I see the heads nodding. They go, "Yeah, it's exactly like that." Well, I didn't guess at that. Pros do not guess, so I always believe step one is active listening. If you do active listening, uh, you'll, you'll automatically create better offers. Like if you see people say, "Hey, I'm stuck on," uh, like we keep getting these low-paying, grass-cutting jobs, but I really want to get the condo complexes. Like immediately, your messaging is, "Let me show you how to use Facebook ads to get the condo complexes, or how to use SEO, or how to redo your website to get the condo complexes." Or like immediately, your messaging is going to be better, and it's going to land harder, and it'll it'll you know like just work. So try that process, unfair sales advantage, because it'll make your life a whole bunch easier. And then you don't have to guess at what these people want. And then what you'll find is whatever method you use to get in front of them will start working better because you'll talk to the thing that they actually want. Which is by the way, they don't generally want marketing services. They're always buying something deeper than that. Um, anyways, I hope that's helpful. Anonymous is, says, what's the best way to figure out? The trending topics in your industry for content creation, Ahrefs, some other keyword research tool, researching Facebook groups, something else. Um, I'll tell you, uh, Anonymous, uh, another person with no pants on. Um, so I actually tend to stay away from short-term trending topics. So I'm just sharing what's working for us. And don't take this as a Bible of like, this is the only way to do it. There's lots of people who have a lot of success with content. I'm one of them, but there's you know people doing way better than me. Uh, but what we like to do is I'm actually most interested in topics that are evergreen, not in what's trending in short term, but stuff that's like literally never going to change. So that when I create a video on the internet, uh, ten years from now, I can still point people to that same video. And I'll tell you, um, maybe eleven years ago. 10, 11, 12 years ago, I created a lawyer YouTube channel. I made like 30 videos and then I gave up on it. And I wish I could tell you I stuck with it, but I didn't. And uh, and what's interesting is I still get phone calls from videos I made um, like a decade ago. And if I had known that back then, I would have made way more videos. Is that the longevity factor? So uh, when I, in terms of content, like when I create content, what I'm thinking about it is I want to talk about things that are still going to be relevant in 10, 12 years, et cetera, so that when we create stuff, like it's still working for us years and years and years and years into the future. As where if I, uh, uh, like, here's a short-term trend. Everybody's talking about the Olympics. So if I create a video about the Olympics, it may, like, be awesome, but, um, you know, in two weeks from now, three weeks from now, it'll probably be forgotten, right? So I want to talk about stuff, like, there's a reason why, like, a lot of my agency stuff focuses on offers why do i talk about offers because 10 years from now people are still gonna have offer problems 20 years from now people are still gonna have offer problems and so the videos will still be relevant so i'll tell you what my favorite research tools real real simple is i just go to the top 10 20 uh youtube channels and uh, and then just sort by popularity and look at their most popular topics and then look for the evergreen stuff that's popular now having said that we are starting to experiment with perplexity and having perplexity summarize those results for us and so i imagine you could probably use chat gpt to do the same thing is like go to the top youtube channel scan them find the popular videos in this channel tell me what they are and you could probably do that in a single prompt and it'll tell you um, you know what the top YouTube channels are and, and what their most popular videos are about and then we just make better videos is our goal on the topics that are, or more in-depth videos on the things that people are most interested in so anyways I hope that's helpful to you because uh, um, I think you know like don't don't reinvent the wheel don't tell people what they should be interested in is focus on what they are interested in, and then intercept them and you can bring them to like you know better higher ideas with that uh, anyways, hope that helps. Richard says, yo, Frankie Finn, would you say the criteria and framework you use for your closing sales with the Loom video is the same 
as a VSL. Um, so there's a lot of overlap between a VSL and a Loom video. I'll tell you where, at least in my experience, the difference is, okay? Um, so a VSL, at least the ones that I learned back in the day, a lot of those were designed for mass market. And because they're mass market, they have a different sort of appeal. Like, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of times the things I create, like I would never watch that. Like I've, I've done like hour and 45 minute training. I would never watch me for hour and 45 minutes because I don't have an hour and 45 minutes of uninterrupted non-children time just to watch something. And, and I'll tell you, as like a busy, successful person, the way you make decisions is very different than like an end consumer who might go home and watch eight hours of Netflix every day of their life, right? So what I found is with like VSL, like I learned from a guy named John Benson, who's like a, a really uh, awesome copywriter who used to have a lot of the top ClickBank performing videos back in the day. And I remember one of John's thing is like, he would start with a pattern interrupt. So it'd be like, this is a fish. And in the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm gonna tell you how this fish is the secret to all your weight loss goals. And it is not about dieting on fish. And it creates a confusion, like a, a what we would call pattern in, interrupt in an open loop. And now you wanna watch the video just like, huh, why is this guy talking about a fish? Well, that works really, really well mass market when you're trying to sell to people who, who will invest 45 minutes and watch a VSL. Personally, I'm way too busy as a like busy, successful business owner. And most of my clients you know, are in the same boat where they just don't have 45 minutes. And so what's different about uh, a Loom video is it's literally just a sales call in fast forward. It's the 80, 20 of a sales call. It's like after doing thousands of these, you hear the same questions, the same comments, same kind of things. And uh, it was like, literally we just do them in fast forward. We just, so like I noticed like a lot of the beginning of the sales calls, them were just wondering, what is this? What is it you guys do? They ask the question all sorts of different ways, but they're just trying to figure out what do you guys do? And then they, they want to know if you show them something they want, like a problem that they can you can solve for them or an outcome you can create, they go, hey, that's interesting. Would that work for me in my situation? And, and then they're looking for reassurance on that. And then they wonder, well, how does it work? Explain to me like logically, technically how it all fits together. And then the last piece they're looking for is um, how much is it? And then if they, they like the price, they, want, they just want to get it. So a Loom video is just that process and fast forward. It's like literally just the 80, 20 sales call made for busy, successful people with money who do not want to jump on the phone, who do not want to jump with who jump through hoops. They just want to know what is it? How does it work? How much is it? Does it work in my situation? How do we get started? And that's it. And like they can make the decision usually based on that, or they may have a follow up question or two. But for the most part, like we're, we're answering the questions they would ask you in a sales call. That's the real magic of it is if you do enough sales calls, you know what they're gonna ask you before they ask you. By the way, I'm not seeing any comments. Sometimes like uh, Facebook is live or live is weird and doesn't show me like people's comments in real time. I don't see them on the, the back end of this system. So I'll see your comments probably after um, we, uh, you know, like go off air kind of thing. But anyways, I hope that's helpful to you because um, Loom videos are designed to sell agency services to busy, successful people with money. VSLs, the ones at least I've seen, are more like um, designed to sell mass market stuff. Having said that, and they often have like a long backstory of how you came to the thing, uh, Loom videos do not have that. You don't need to tell people who you are and how you discovered some magic weight loss secret in the Andes Mountains while you were meditating, drinking coffee with a Buddhist monk. Like they don't care about any of that. Um, so there's a time and place for both of them and they, they both have a lot of overlapping persuasion factors, but it's like literally with a Loom video, we're just answering questions we knew they were gonna ask before they asked them. Uh, George says, this is a really good one here. George says, in Beyond the Agency Box 2.0, Frankie Finn wrote, there are only ever three ways you can help your clients have a bigger payday. One, get more new people. Two, help them increase their transaction size. Three, sell more frequently to their customers. Anyone have ideas about how you sell more frequently to patients of an oral surgery practice? Unlike a dental office where you need to go in every six to 12 months for dental cleanings and exams, oral surgeons typically provide wisdom teeth extractions one time and dental implants one to several times and sometimes full arch replacements. The first thing that came to mind for me was offer a friends and family special. So firstly, George, obviously, um, <coughs> this is a, tr <coughs> excuse me, a tricky scenario. And there's a couple ways you can go with it. We, we, and I, I mentioned this in the comments for those of you guys who didn't see it, but it's a similar challenge in like personal injury law because it's not like people usually go and get in six car accidents. When they get in one, 
um, that's that's really the only thing happening. So it's not like you can sell them, hey, let me be your car accident lawyer six more times. As we're saying, like a restaurant, you can sell the same service again and again and again. Like, hey, if you really like the chicken, come back tomorrow. We got a special on steaks, right? Uh, you got to try the steak too, right? So some businesses are, di- but I'll tell you, th- this is a misnomer. What this causes people to believe is my business is transactional and then they treat it transactional and they miss the bigger picture. So here's my favorite example t- uh, told through a Jay Abraham story. Is uh, So this was a conversation we were having together and he was talking about he got hired by the biggest driving school in Japan. And what they found out is like people come in the door, they go to driving school, they go pass their driving test. And again, it seemed on the surface to be transactional, right? Because because it's not like when somebody goes to get their driver's license, they go six more times, right? So once they finish driving school and pass their you know road examination, that's it. They don't they don't hire them again, right? And so what Jay ultimately realized though is is and this is a very very powerful question to ask is to ask what do they buy before, after, and instead of, right? Instead of your before and after and instead of your thing. So you mentioned the oral surgery. And in your case. Uh, one of the options may be to, to really think about what they buy after. I don't know what that is, but I would probably feed that question to ChatGPT, say, this is what we do, this is what we offer. Like, what do people buy after this that like is complementary to this thing? And in, in Jay's case, what they figured out is that once people be, got their driving exam, in Japan, it's very common because there's like a lot of traffic and stuff, that people rent cars on weekends and, and they don't own cars because it just makes more practical sense to rent it on a weekend go do your little trips and shopping and whatever, and then give the car back after the weekend. Well, what they eventually uh, decided to do was to become an affiliate for one of the car rental places. They said, hey, we'd like to, to recommend you and become our, you know, our recommended partner. Could we get a kickback and a special deal for our people every time they rented a car from you? And those people said, sure, no problem. And what happened is they actually made more money recommending cars because it was an ongoing thing. Like people would rent it every weekend or every other weekend or once a month, right? They would rent a car and rent a car and rent a car and they would get a kickback from it uh, every time. And eventually they realized that they weren't in the driving school business, that they were really just a lead generator for the car rental business. So that the magic of that comes from the question, what do they buy before, after, and instead of? Now, having said that, if you wanted to sell the easiest thing, as you mentioned, is just create a little referral offer, which is, you know, friends and family get some kind of, and and my favorite way of doing it, by the way, is a gift certificate, because it has real perceived value, but especially if they have flexible pricing. So like, for example, if you give them a $500 gift certificate to give to friends and family, they look cool because they've given $500. But if it's custom pricing, and say you were gonna charge $28,000 for a set of dental implants, well, now you can charge 28500 and go, hey, we're going to knock down the price to 28000 and you still got what you were going to get anyway. And, and the people feel like they got a special deal and like it was all good and hunky-dory. So having said that, um, the, the magic of that is what do they buy before, after, and instead of? And chances are there's some opportunities for you to create affiliate deals on the after part of that. Um, like I know, for example, like after somebody gets in a car accident, they often need additional medical help. Well, we could like become an affiliate for those medical programs. Hey, doctor, I'd like to send you some business. I don't know about the legalities of that. I'm just kind of like, uh, you know, like talking about different options. Some of those people might want home food delivered because now they're like, they're, they're you know, they're physically disabled, right? Some of those people like may want uh, chiropractic services to help them rehab, for example. That would be super easy to negotiate affiliate deals on, right? Um, so I just say that to you because there's all kinds of other things. If, if I was going to like test that out, I would, the before, after, and instead of question, I would give to ChatGPT because I don't know what it is in your industry. Well, but I bet you AI could at least point you in the right direction with it. Um, anyways, I hope that's helpful. Johnny says, does anyone else here insist the client allow you to first build them a website designed to optimize all marketing efforts? Um, so this, this is a, one of the key principles I wrote about in, in our book, which is the idea of an add-on or replacement offer. And whenever you sell a replacement offer, you really have two sales to make. Sale number one is that whatever you're doing right now is not working and you should stop doing that. And sale number two is you should use my thing instead. And it's actually the first sale that's the hard one. So like, for example, if I go to 
a dentist and I try and sell them Facebook ads and they have a Facebook ads provider. Well, now before I can sell them Facebook ads, I have to convince them to fire their existing provider. That's a harder sell than actually trying to get them to use my Facebook ad. They may say, I'm happy with this person or I want to give them a chance or we just hired them. We'd like to give them at least three months to show us what they can do or, you know, I'm not, I just don't want to switch. It's too much hassle, right? So whenever you're trying to tell a client, even if their, their website sucks, that they need to build a new one, you're into replacement offer territory. And so I, I found the best way to do that as a workaround from a functional point of view is that wherever you need to run like personalized landing pages and things like that that you 100 percent control because otherwise you're gonna you're gonna have that hey you, your existing website sucks and you should get rid of it and you should use mine and it's the first sale they're gonna fight you on even though what you're saying is true and all client kinds of clients uh have shitty websites but they've also like often been through a lot of bad website experiences where they hired somebody it didn't work out and all those kind of things and so like you know um trying to get them to like switch over to like you know a different one is, is going to be a challenge in and of itself so what i would suggest is really really focus on like figuring out a way where you can add on to their infrastructure and then get what you need chances are that's probably landing pages but if you fight them and what they're doing now like you're just gonna have a really hard time in life in general because you're gonna always be telling them your existing stuff is crap and you need to stop doing it and they'll fight you on that piece instead of where if you're a bolt-on, if you're an additional, like, and I'll give you an example of this. When we, like I mentioned earlier, when we used to do Facebook ads for motorcycle cases for attorneys, um, like, it was it was pretty easy to be an add-on because they would say, well, we already got a Facebook ads guy. And I'd say, well, do they specifically focus on motor vehicle or on uh, motorcycle accidents? Or are they just going after, like, any sort of motor vehicle accident case? And they'd say, I think they're just going after any sort of motor vehicle accident. I say, well, that's fine. Like, we're not even aiming it at the same thing, right? Like, even though we, like, just let them run their ads in your account and we'll run our ads simultaneously to them and we'll go after different types of cases and they can do their thing and we can do our thing in the account. Like, you, you don't have to let them go. Let us both work in the same account. And then go, oh, okay. And essentially all I'm saying is make it an add-on. Make it an add-on and you don't have to fire somebody. So wherever possible, if you can make your thing an add-on, you're just going to, you're going to, have an easier time than trying to sell them, hey, your existing website sucks, replace it with me. Even though that statement is probably 100% true and would be immensely helpful to them to resolve that problem, you're still gonna have the, the challenge of them fighting you on it. And they've probably been through the gauntlet with many web designers and it's you know a lot of empty promises. TJ, last question. By the way, I'm sure you guys have, have said more in the comments unless I'm just like imagining I'm talking to myself. That's cool if I am. But uh, I, I'm not seeing any of the comments. I'll probably get all of these after we go off air just because sometimes like the back end of Facebook just does not work like it's supposed to. Anyways, TJ's up says, do you guys give any perks to clients for receiving a video testimonial? This is a damn good one. Um, video testimonials. Firstly, let's talk about um, um, video testimonials. Okay, so... When you actually get a client video testimonial, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the strategy of this. What most clients will do in their nature is they will believe the point of a video testimonial is to endorse you. And so they'll say, um, you know, something along the lines of, uh, hey, I highly recommend Frankie Finn and their services, right? And that's not what you want clients to say about you. What you want them to say is, I was dealing with these problems, I hired these guys to solve them. This is what the process looked like working with them. These are the outcomes they've created. And then at the end of it, I would recommend them and here's why, right? But, but you wanna get into the specifics of what problems they were dealing with, what that process looked like of solving it, um, how they help, what sort of outcomes they were able to create because the clients will do that better than anyone. Now, as far as incentivizing them, um, I think you should always, always, always say thank you, but I don't think you should ever incentivize it because otherwise you're just gonna get like, prostitution testimonials that are like not very good because they're they, they omit those details but like always always say thank you like a thank you gift is in order but don't don't like make it about the thank you gift like give me a video testimonial and i'll give you blank instead hey you gave me a video testimonial and as a way of saying thank you i know you love starbucks so i got you a 50 dollars gift card because i really appreciate it whatever that is for you and by the way uh john rulin's book called giftology will teach you more about uh, gifts than anything I could ever say on this um, weekly Q&A. It's like it's all about what 
what he says in that book. Everything I know about gifting comes straight from that book. So John Rulin, R-U-H-L-I-N, called Giftology. But having said that, you want your testimonials to tell a story. And by the way, uh, I should mention, you guys do not need to, uh, to have clients say so to create case studies. You can turn any client success into a teaching example. You can say, hey, here's a client we had. These are the problems they had. This is what we did for them. This is what that process looked like. These are the outcomes it created. These are some of the mistakes we made along the way. You do not need a client to do that. And by the way, this is something not enough people understand as well, is you can actually use other people in your industry as case studies, as long as you don't falsely represent them as you, if they use the same or similar methodology. So for example, years ago, uh, Stephen Yen and I got the idea that we were gonna test a referral thing. And I, it, was, it was a conversation I had with an attorney who said, they get all their referral biz business from referrals. And I said, how do you do that? And they said, well, once a month or once every two months, I create a big event at the bar and I invite a bunch of people together for a business get together. It's free and, and they all come to my event, but I strategically invite the kinds of people who have a lot of referrals. And so in my case, it was a personal injury lawyer. So they invited the physiotherapists, they invited the big chiropractors, they invited the auto body shops, like other people who had accident vi victims. They also invited people who were kind of just influencers in the community, the guy who ran the big cell phone store, uh, the local politician, and they invited all these people to a networking event so they could all get together and discuss business and figure stuff out. And he said, as long as I was helpful to people, they would, I would always get referrals out of it. And he explained how he created the event. And basically, like he just sent invitations in the mail and then called people and said, hey, are you coming to the event? And that was it. And that was how they got people. And we were like, hey, man, we could create a package where we make a list of all the local influencers, send them physical invitations in the mail, and then have somebody call them and say, like, hey, are you coming? And, and put these together as referral events where you can run. They don't cost you anything out of pocket. And we'll just set it up. Well, at the time of doing that, this is the number of attorneys I had ever run it for, <coughs> zero. But I knew several real life attorneys that were actually like succeeding with that model. And so I used those as case studies. I said, tell me about these events. Tell me what it works. Tell me what a typical result is like for you. Can I interview you about it? Now I never say in there, this is my client and this is what we did for them. I just say, hey, we'd like to help you put together something similar. If you wanna have your own referral event and you don't have time to figure out who's who and put together invitations and message people and follow them up to make sure you just wanna show up at an event and talk to people, uh, we can put together all those details for you. Well, that worked. Um, we never uh, scaled that up just for fulfillment reasons. That turned out to be like a little more complex than I imagined, to be a little more manual and things like that. Although knowing what I know now, we could probably scale that much better. But I share that with you guys because um, um, point being is that like uh, you can create, you can borrow case studies. There's somebody somewhere using a similar methodology to you who's gotten results and you can interview them. You can share their results and then you can talk about at the end of it how you've created something similar. Like, you know, like uh, if, 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 if you're a brand new personal trainer and you've never helped anybody to lose weight, but part of your methodology involves like a plant-based diet. Find somebody who's lost weight on a plant-based diet and then say, hey, can I interview you? Talk about the benefits of a plant-based diet, turn it into a case study, and then say, if you guys would like to do something similar, I can help you do that, right? So like, if you really think about that, you're not limited by, a lot of people think, oh, I need case studies before I can start. I need testimonials. I need all these things. And you can, you can actually create them out of thin air, even if you've got zero clients. So. Uh, anyways, I hope that's helpful to you guys because I think too many people get tripped up on stuff that does not need to be that complicated. So uh, that's all we got for questions today. Appreciate you guys coming on here and hanging with me another Monday. Uh, for those of you guys seeing the replay on Tuesday or Wednesday on YouTube, appreciate you guys too. And uh, as I mentioned in the, in the intro, uh, we are uh, pretty much at capacity at the Wolfpack, but we're building a ton of tools right now to make a lot of agency implementing a lot easier and figuring out offers and uh, like, you know, creating content and webinars and outreach programs and stuff. We're using AI to like really scale those up. So if you guys um, are interested in uh, potentially joining, as I said, um, there is a waiting list right now, but give me a holler. And uh, uh, as soon as we're open, I will, you know, let you guys know when that is. And uh, we can party and scale those phone list, meeting list agencies up. So that's all I got for you guys in uh, today's edition. Much love, appreciate you guys. And from Mexico, uh, happy Monday. May the force be with you.
Guys, if you like this video, you're also going to want to grab some free bonuses, which you can get at our website, Beyond Agency Profits, to make it easy for you. I've put the links to it in the description of this video, as well as pinned in the top comment. And we've got a couple of awesome things. This is what you'll get after you sign up. You get some of our best training, how we're closing clients over Loom videos, how we sometimes sign clients. That is not a misprint for under five US dollars. Uh, how to demonstrate your value in like amazing ways, trainings, how to have your clients write the best copy of your life, how we're closing without phone calls, campaigns that we've generated for clients for, that have done over $100,000, as well as scripts you can use to get conversations going with clients in under 10 minutes. All you got to simply do is go there, enter your name and email address, and then this is what you'll see on the other side. So if that's interesting to you, make sure to click the links below and I will see you on the other side.